Africans must be free. 
Rastafari Anywhere you go, them I say Rastafari They fight against their brothers each and every day No one to give and help in hand and try to stop this killing Stop them, Jack, stop them Before it gets too late Stop them, Jack, stop them Before it gets too late Either time to get Jack Shall surely be with the radio culture expression we are looking for something different very very different so we're going somewhere to come back into the old school or the rubber dub and now listen and listen carefully because nothing has changed for us listen black people No other case on American soil, let alone a crime that never happened, has led to as many appeals, trials, and retrials as the Scottsboro Boys case. The nine young black teenagers from Alabama had their lives ruined after getting accused of being two white women near Scottsboro. The case marked a turning point in the civil rights movement. Despite strong evidence supporting their innocence, all white juries found eight of the nine defendants guilty and sentenced them to death by electric chair, causing national outrage. Here is what happened to the Scottsboro Boys. The 1930s was a time when many things happened. The Great Depression started in 1929 and caused widespread poverty, high unemployment rates, and terrible living conditions. With no savings or jobs, thousands of Americans became homeless. In 1931, President Herbert Hoover made the Star-Spangled Banner the national anthem. 
the same year, there was also the Scottsboro Trials, a case that shook the nation. During this period, many people found comfort in hoboing. Riding freight trains became a fun adventure, a welcome escape from mundane routines. Others hopped on trains in an effort to find new opportunities. On March 25, 1931, around 24, mostly young men of both white and black descent came aboard the Memphis freight train. Some of the black teenagers heard rumors about government jobs in Memphis. They would have to haul logs onto the river. Although the wages for such work would have been meager, the teenagers were eager to try it out. On board the train, there were other black teens from different parts of Georgia. White youth were also there. After failing to find work at the cotton mills in Chattanooga, the white youth were on their way back to Huntsville. As the train crossed the Alabama border, one of the white youths stepped on the hands of a black man named Haywood Patterson. Patterson was not alone on that train. His friends quickly took the stand, and a fight broke out. The black youths managed to force most of the white gang members off the train, leaving only one behind. Patterson risked his life by pulling the remaining white youth, Orville Gilly, back onto the train as it accelerated. Some of the expelled whites went to the station master in Stevenson to report an alleged assault by a group of black people. The station master sent a message ahead, and a posse in Paint Rock, Alabama stopped the train. Armed men surrounded the train. The goal was simple, capture every black teenager you can find. When the police came on board the train, they found something else. Two white women, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, hiding in the train, dressed in men's clothing. The woman immediately accused the nine black teenagers of f***ing them. Despite the lack of evidence, f***ing was considered a massive crime and often came with a death sentence. These captured black teens, who would later be known as the Scottsboro Boys, were tied together with a plow line, loaded onto a flatbed truck, and thrown in jail. The exact reason why Price and Bates fabricated an obvious lie is unknown. But we can guess. By accusing the Scottsboro Boys of they could avoid facing charges of their own, such as being charged with vagrancy, having no permanent residence or means of support, or violating the Mann Act, crossing state lines for immoral purposes. These charges could have been brought against them when they were rounded up by the posse in Paint Rock. Bates later admitted that when she withdrew her testimony and stated that the did not happen. Also, at the time, the young women probably wanted to get even with some of the black boys who forced their boyfriends out of the train. Before the incident, only four of the black boys had known each other. This was the beginning of the Scottsboro case that lasted for several years, spanning from 1931 to 1937. Haywood Patterson, Ozzy Powell, Eugene Williams, Charlie Weems, Willie Roberson, Olin Montgomery, Clarence Norris, and brothers Leroy and Andrew Wright were taken to the local county seat to await trial. News quickly spread and the white community was furious. A large crowd of more than 100 people gathered around the jail in Scottsboro. They wanted to lynch the accused boys without a fair trial. Luckily, their plans were destroyed when the governor of Alabama, Benjamin Meek Miller, dispatched the National Guard to keep the boys safe. It's truly crazy what they went through. Stories like these are exactly why we made our ebook called The Root. It breaks down our real history, the traps that keep us stuck in the system, and how to become the best versions of yourself. It'll cost you less than a meal at Chipotle if you'd like to support. Everything goes back into making high-level documentaries like these. Click the first link in our description to grab yours now. Thank you. Now let's get back into it. March 30th, 1931. The grand jury formally charges the boys with the crime of When a grand jury indicts someone, it means that they have reviewed the evidence presented and have enough proof to proceed with the trial. But there were no signs of on Price or Brace's bodies. April 6, 1931. The trial begins. Judge A. E. Hawkins was assigned to the case. April 7th to April 9th, 1931. Haywood Patterson, Willie Roberson, Olin Montgomery, Clarence Norris, Eugene Williams, Charlie Weems, and Ozzie Powell were found guilty and given the death penalty. Roy Wright's trial ended without a verdict when certain jurors insisted on the death penalty despite the prosecution's request for a life sentence. According to the Associated Press, the boys were composed and unemotional as the judge sentenced them to die by electric chair. Well, to be honest, they probably knew what was coming. This marked a critical step in the legal proceedings and thrust the case into the national spotlight. The indictment not only placed the Scottsboro boys in imminent danger, but also intensified the racial divisions within the community and the nation as a whole. Supporters of the defendants, along with civil rights organizations and activists, rallied to their defense, questioning the validity of the charges and highlighting the deep-rooted prejudices and inequalities present in society. The death penalty for the Scottsboro boys set the stage for a long and arduous legal battle that would span several years and involve numerous trials, appeals, and public demonstrations. It marked a critical juncture in a case that would ultimately expose the systemic injustices faced by all black people and serve as a catalyst for the civil rights movement. 
Telegrams and countless letters poured into the courts, county, governor, attorney general, the president, and Congress to release the young black men. People all across the country organized mass protests, demonstrations, and boycotts to free the Scottsboro Boys. April to December 1931, the International Labor Defense and NAACP fought for the right to represent the boys. The ILD was established in 1925 with the sole purpose to oppose organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and handle controversial, high-profile cases like Bartolomeo Vanzetti and Nicholas Sacco. The NAACP was one of the nation's well-known civil rights groups established in 1909. When the NAACP decided to join the legal battle, they found that the ILD had already taken on the case. This led to both groups launching campaigns to discredit each other. The NAACP accused the ILD of exploiting the Scottsboro case for communist propaganda, while the ILD saw the NAACP as too moderate, eager to comprise with the ruling class for small benefits. Both organizations had their impact, but in the end, the ILD won over the boys' parents. This had a decisive impact on the outcome. June 22, 1931, the death sentence was temporarily postponed while the defendants filed an appeal to the Alabama Supreme Court. The executions cannot proceed until the higher court reviews and decides on the appeal. July 10, 1931, on the scheduled day of their own planned executions, the Scottsboro Boys listened to the execution of Willie Stokes, who was the first among 10 African Americans to be executed at the prison in the next 10 years. After the Scottsboro Boys heard disturbing and horrifying accounts of Willie's final moments, many of them couldn't sleep. They had horrible nightmares, which had a massive psychological impact. Communist parties in other nations also organized protests and gatherings to advocate for the release of the boys. For example, in July 1931, there was a rally of 150,000 German workers, where Wright delivered a speech in a desperate attempt to save her sons. January 5, 1932, Ruby Bates wrote a letter to Earl Streetman, her boyfriend at the time. She claimed that the police forced her to make a false statement and expressed her desire to clear her name and told Earl that she loves him. She also admitted to being drunk at the time of the incident and was hanging with the white boys, not the black boys. So, she didn't want the black boys to be hurt because of her. March 1932. The Alabama Supreme Court, with a majority vote of 6 to 1, upheld the guilty verdicts of seven of the Scottsboro boys. But the court determined that Eugene, being underage at the time, can't be held fully responsible for his actions. May to November 1932. Because of process violations, the Supreme Court decided to intervene and review the case. It was concluded that the black boys didn't receive a fair trial because they didn't have enough time to prepare and their lawyers were incompetent in many ways. For example, their defense lawyers wanted to have all nine defendants tried together, even though it could harm Roy Wright, the youngest among them at the age of 12. The prosecution, however, chose to try the defendants in smaller groups. During the trial, Victoria Price testified that the defendants threatened to harm them if they didn't comply. However, her cross-examination lasted only a few minutes, and the examining doctors were not questioned at all. Neither did they question any of the contradictions between Price's testimony and Ruby Bates's testimony. The defense called only the defendants as witnesses, but their testimonies were confusing, sometimes made no sense at all, and were filled with obvious misstatements. May 8, 1933. A massive group of 4,000 people marched for six miles through the streets of Washington, D.C. in the middle of a rainy day. They called for the release of the Scottsboro Boys. March to April 1933, the second trial of Haywood Patterson took place in Decatur. Judge James Horton was assigned to the case. Here, Ruby Bates withdrew her testimony. Nevertheless, a couple days later, Patterson was found guilty and given the death penalty. This caused another public outrage. Thousands of black Americans joined hundreds of white supporters at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Ruby addressed the crowd and joined the protests. The demonstrators also advocated for the freedom of labor leader, Tom Mooney, Yule Lee, an African American facing the death sentence, and Angelo Herndon, a black communist labor organizer charged with rebellion in Georgia. President Franklin Roosevelt declined to meet with the delegation. This angered the demonstrators, but it didn't force them to give up. Instead, representatives prepared a petition with 155,000 signatures to the White House Appointments Secretary. The crowd paused their march and gathered outside the White House, where they sang and chanted, Free the Scottsboro Boys. These demonstrations forced the judge to postpone the rest of the trials. June to December 1933, all the efforts seemed to pay off. Well, at least for a little while. Judge Horton overturns Haywood Patterson's conviction and orders a new trial. In October, the Scottsboro cases were no longer in the hands of Judge Horton and were moved to the courts of Judge William Callahan. But this victory was short-lived. In the winter, Clarence Norris and Haywood Patterson were charged with convicted and received the death sentence. June to October 1934, Judge Horton 
who had not encountered any opposition in his previous election, failed in his attempt to be re-elected. In October, two attorneys were accused of trying to bribe Victoria Price to try and persuade her to change her testimony. February to December 1935, Samuel Leibowitz appeared before the U.S. Supreme Court. He explained that there was not enough black jurors in Jackson County who would defend the interests of the black community. He presents the justices with jury rolls containing fake names, and they examine the inks on the page with a magnifying glass. On April 1st, in the case of Norris v. Alabama, the Supreme Court rules that excluding black individuals from jury rolls violates their right to equal protection under the law, as stated in the 14th Amendment. The case is overturned and sent back to a lower court. Patterson's case is not argued due to technicalities and filing dates, but the court strongly urges the lower courts to review his case given the circumstances. In December, both Leibowitz and the ILD are seen as burdens for the defendants, leading to a reorganization of the defense. The Scottsboro Defense Committee is established, chaired by Alan Knight Chalmers, and local attorney Clarence Watts is appointed as co-counsel. January to December 1936. On January 23rd, Patterson is convicted and given a 75-year prison sentence. The next day, during the transfer to Birmingham jail, Ozzie Powell attacks Deputy Edgar Blaylock with a knife and cuts his throat. Sheriff Jay Sandlin intervenes, shooting Powell in the head. Both Blaylock and Powell survive. In December, Lieutenant Governor Thomas Knight, who served as the prosecuting attorney, met Leibowitz in New York to discuss a potential agreement. May to December, 1937. In May, Thomas Knight passed away. In the summer, Clarence took charge of the defense. Andy Wright was convicted and sentenced to 99 years. Charlie Weems was given a 75-year sentence. Ozzie Powell pleaded guilty to assaulting Blaylock and received a 20-year sentence, but the charges were dropped. In the winter, Governor Bibb Graves met with Alan Knight Chalmers to talk about offering clemency to the five convicted Scottsboro boys. In the years that followed, some of the boys were granted parole and released, but their lives would never be the same. In 1944, Andy Wright and Clarence Norris were released but violated their parole and were sent back to jail shortly after. In 1946, Ozzie Powell was released and Norris received another parole. Patterson's fate was a lot more cruel. Because he was left with no other option, he escaped from prison in 1948, but in 1951, he was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced back to prison. In 1976, Clarence Norris received a pardon charges, even today, fit a particular pattern. There is a misconception that black men always prey on white women, when in fact, in some cases, the opposite is true. Throughout history, black people were victimized by white men. This has been going on for generations and generations. The Scottsboro boys were spared their electric chair, but they rotted in prison for many years. Even after their release, many of them never really recovered from the traumatic experience. Their story is truly a tragedy. These boys never got to experience their teens or live a life of freedom. They were stuck in a cell over something they never did. This story was truly heartbreaking, but it's one that needed to be told. Like and subscribe to the channel so you can join the movement. We aren't just making documentaries, we're changing lives and waking the people up. Click the video on the screen to learn some more black history. Yes. Now, myself personally, that's my situation is very similar in um, England, London, Islington, with the police charging, arresting 18 young people and charging them for robbing unknown persons. So my whole life changed because I got involved in that and I mentally felt that <coughs> This nonsense, this should not, it was nonsense, it should not be tolerated, and <coughs> we must rally the troops them and have our day in court, our, our time. And it's very similar because it was, it was a long, drawn-out process, and I just had to assure the families that their children were innocent. And I always wanted to know from the authorities, how is it that I was not one of those who were arrested or whose homes, parents' homes, were doors were broken down and them draw their children out. So, right? And the reason was is that I was with them. We all were together at the carnival, and we left the carnival together. When the, when the fight started coming up, um, 
by Metro. I said it's time for us to leave. We watched the, the affray start down Portobello Road and it start escalating and everything and Shaka play and we was right there with him, with with um Shaka Sound, uh, listening to Shaka Sound very close to him and so on. And we left. Right, because the battle of them start coming and the police were farming, you know. You can see them farming and everything, right? And that farming was, they were um, creating a kind of a circle around the people, them. And at some point, they were going to squash them. Because the horses and everybody come. Because we could have seen it from up, up there, sir. And we're on top, we're on top of um, phone box and listening to Shaka go on with, you know. And we there, we there listening, and we get the drum and bass and everything. We are get it, but we are see like TV, the, the, this this these altercations, and it weren't where we were. And Shaka never want to stop play because it nothing to, nothing to do with him, nothing to do with all of us up there. But we we'll watch it. So when we when I saw all the police and others, big man them see all the police. Come here, you saying we. See how the police them are create their little their circle and everything, and a lot of people never see the art. I don't. We don't think them see the asses. People them come, you know. So at some point we know so that them going moving and stranglehold the people as down there by dove vendor and all them something. There. So we say time for leave, and we left, and we walk. Crossed by Metro, crossed by, by um, um, what a station name, and up the road and past the police station and everything, and past Edgeway Road and everything. We just walk all the way down King's Cross and go off the Park. Simple. Uh, two days later, to write it, this is what happened. So, we'll I run that by one again because we don't want to talk that talk there too long. So we want to play some vintage rhythms, you know what I mean? So here we are now. Come. <laughs> Comment to why and forbid them not for such the kingdom of heaven. Cause you know all that people do, can all the wicked do, and all the child should lead them, you know. Thank you. 
Jag lyssnade sen då med Tillman. Hej! Listen good! Read him! What I... Seven. Yeah, I'm after telling a story, you know. You see all this rhythm, yeah? This is four rhythms in one, you know. You understand? Four rhythms in one. Augustus Pablo, one of them time there, a mood, a serious mood swing. And Gossie Clark, I tell you, the rhythm was, the second rhythm was, a, was created for a, a brother named Jalefan. Wicked rhythm. One day, I must play it for you. See? Jalefan. And then, Something happened, something happened. And this is what you can call reggae fusion, you know, but not Nagoso. It just, it just, yo, the chalice was bossing. Yeah. Listen. Yo, Dawood, listen good, listen carefully, listen keenly. Except, excite yourself, man. Four rhythms in a one. Dub wise, boss is black and a boss is Pablo. La 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 Yeah, what happened to that one there? Eh? Shot that something up, man. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Musical ticker is swing easy.
your beauty Where blessing awaits for us all And if your heart is clean I know you will redeem In the land of the black, gold and green It is a land that is holy the holiest land you'll ever see And if we unite as one I know we can understand About the land of the black, gold and green Holy, holy, holy The holiest land
Strictly sensey, proper things, you understand? And a skunk people me, don't bother with it. You are on no our good, you are on no our good, girl. I agree. For the things that you do in front of me. Original. Yes, Rasta. Far
Sin, you better know. Beautiful. Man called Michael Prophet Selection, I do play. Yeah.
Yeah, man, wicked. to be a man called Augustus Clark, see? <laughs> Thank you. 
If you holler, you will screw. And if you screw, you become a bindy boo. Yeah. <laughs> Vocalist by the man called Tony Crucial Tough. Hi, boy. Crucial tough man, don't bluff, stick with us. Ooh, yeah. I'm a granny, they grow me, you know? yeah. <laughs> In all my life, she never had to beat me, you know? I tell you, she just tell me, tell me things, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah, I was an obedient child.
me tell you, man, because Kusa Tony Tuff says, keep your love light shining. Me I tell you. So you want to know, Marcia. <laughs> Marcia and Aisha were here, the big sound. And we are say guidance you now, one after this and gone. Come to the gate, yeah, so we can celebrate and be real great. May I tell you, settle Aisha. People, people. Uh. Now this is Katy calling, you know. And I am calling all the people of the land to get on the salvation train before it is too late. And all I want you to do right now is to get up on the track as I would compel you. And I would never really beg you, you know. Now listen. Kingston, St. Catherine, Clarendon, Manchester, Westmoreland, St. James, Trelawney, St. Anne. Heavenly Father out there, what you want to hear me right now? journey <laughs> yeah so it's sweet me man it's sweet me i tell you so what me now we have to do what go cross river jordan we are Selimville. we are cross river jordan and just uh, bow down and submit and yeah we are say cross river jordan and submit okay <laughs> Road with a jardin Road with a jardin If the rich man don't try to help the poor Yes, you see I always want to play for R.U.Z, you know. Long, long time when I play for R.U.Z. We we'll meet up with Jabones and everything. Me, just, me love his vibration, me respect him, love him as a teacher and everything. But for him, song was soft. City Dread was soft. You know what I mean? And it's not even that they were soft. 
It's just that when Jabones even organize it, it just it just there, you know what I mean? And as a young man now and everything come out to come out to the blue spot stable and all them something there and we develop for we own something with Mr. Errol. You understand? I beat up a black and jet and him and him uncle and everything, you know. These all these years, you know, no sir, me. You understand? And maybe him know, but him no want to say nothing. You understand? Tropical, don't beat. You understand? And Tropical was one of the sound them that got half or so much of France or sound. Because Sir Lloyd Poor got some of France or sound in terms of the, the Tanai and some bass boxes. And Fat Man too. Franco, you know, Franco was a wackard son. <laughs> you understand? Right? So Tropical was going on with something. You understand? But we are come. You see? Ali was just him good, him nice, you know what I mean? But him time, him time I move away, man. Him, him needed some young blood, fresh, fresh young blood. I'm going to come and just slap them up. Time after time, with all these gusty clark here, you, know. you see, <laughs> in that time, black and not go coxing them time there, you, know. you understand? No, which coxing? Him can't go Georgian, and him can't go ESC either. Him can't go row in 20s, never mind Georgian, I tell you. But when him come, him come good, you know, and I would have loved to be out there, and me and him work, you understand, around London and thing. You understand? But then him change up, him change up, him start going with certain things and everything. But it was a it was a good it was a good thing, Black Adjud. <laughs> he's good he's good in the studio, you know. Black Adjud is, is a good producer. Trust. I say that. I don't I don't know about other people. So Lily Thompson, we have said this, you know, because <laughs> So we just went down memory lane, you know, and at that time it was about that what, sixteen, seventeen? But Sir Lloyd Power, I'm a champion sound man. Sir Power, Sir Lloyd Power. Sound that beat up, bad, kill every sound. Where I say? Rough them up. <laughs> Sir Lloyd Power. Proper DJ, proper selectors, everything. Sound mellow and powerful. You understand? Powerful Sir Lloyd Power. <laughs> All them sound there, Duke Alley and all them sound there, you know, and Admiral King and Shelley and all of them. Them sound they're heavy, you know. We see Salad Poa. Salad Poa heavy and mellow with re- with yeah, with rhythm. Not 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 rhythm, you know. They have melody, yeah, not rhythm, melody. Salad Poa, I tell you. And the only other sound that heavy and mellow and crisp. Was never the enchanter. Don't make them people come fool one and tell them all kind of something. <laughs> you understand? But Sir Lloyd Poor, the bigger the all, the badder, the rougher that sound there, man. That sound there. And the, the brother was an African brother, Errol. Yeah? That builder, that, that's, that's one of his best ever amplifiers. You understand? The African brother there. Right? Because there are three Errol in us, so don't get twisted. With, with these things, because some people them think say them know who. Nah. You understand? The classic Errol was the chief engineer of British Airway. The other two, they are friars, but the classic, the next one, the Gargan Errols, the African brother, are in Bill. The best amplifier him ever produced was the amplifier that in Bill for Sir Lord Power. See? And I can describe how him did that, you know, but you know, another time, because it was unique. Metronas, Metrona run that style there. None of the other man them run that style there. See? Because him had a power pack. A power pack. And the ampage, the watts, and a separate board. I saw him bright, was bright. That man there. Well bright. And Sir Lloyd Power, them follow his instructions, just like Neville. And run a vote, a vote line, yeah. And nobody, nobody can talk 
when Sir Lord Poa I deal with the power. So you can read you can read that in times you know, and, and the Guardian, the history of Sir Lord Poa and Black House. You can read that and see the photograph. You can read that. And don't let them man them tell you, say, we come from Shubin. We not come from no Shubin. See? We not come from no Shubin. Road boys, yes, they were road boys. We not come from no Shubin. Sir Lord Poa, very intelligent when it comes to music and um, creating music and them own dubs and everything. And Slim Smith are for them artists. Slim Smith, the late great Slim Smith. I, mean, I tell you no. See? And then what does what he have now? Um, what the man in him? Hey, what are we teaching him? Prince Buster. See? There's nobody in England can tell you say, Prince Buster for them teach and Prince Buster for them guide. Them come them can't tell you say, them they know Prince Buster, they met him or something. So they can't tell you nothing more than that. You're at it. I tell you, even Cox and them, they can't tell you more than that. Because him, him not work with none of them. And work just with Sir Lord Poa. You understand? Yes. <laughs> Proper things. Well, Shelly could have talked, but Shelly not there again. You know what I mean? God bless all them and the soul. Hold this. <laughs> And it's funny, you know, them man they don't, don't come at Islington and interview. Hey, them man, hey, all of the, them, them man they that live and work should be in. And that's what them do, you know. Them so biased. Yeah, joke. Lord. With a da da, roll with a da da. The rich man don't try to help the poor man. Blood can a roll like with a da da. I did feel say I should for play that, you know. But you know what? It have the right thing, but it's the wrong time. So we I say. Guidance. Yeah, Morgan Heritage. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come. Yeah, let me go down that avenue. Who to be conscious? Then we we'll try everything. Everything, yeah. Just to hold you down. Just to hold you down. Down, 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 down. So, yeah. Rockers. We are warriors. The system can't hold us down. Down. We are warriors. 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 We are 
no dust and we gonna make it They got to face it Stay on the battlefield, we gonna take it And we won't stand by complacent Living adjacent to Babylon's wicked displacement No way no Dancing way. with the fire, burning bars of steel Fire Till the letter brought the bougie out of jail No If you not see it first, then you gonna feel That we are warriors for real Real We are warriors The system can't hold us down We are warriors Chop down the chains, we're free to move around We are warriors We have a plan to the games they play So we're doing everything one way Jah way We are warriors Jah love, we come to take the town We are warriors We carry soul, this train is freedom bound